Truth Frequency Radio Network. KTFRN. Worldwide. Shadowland Voyagers, in the spirit of sovereignty and self-empowerment, we invite you to journey with us into the Shadowland. Let's rediscover, reclaim, and integrate the fragmented aspects of our individual and collectively held consciousness. Realize true freedom and restore authentic expression. Could it be the only way out is through the Shadowland? Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Shadowland Voyagers. We're all here tonight. Sienna Leah, Christina, are you there? Yeah. And Elizabeth? Hello. Good morning. Good evening. Yes, Christina, we can't hear you. Are you there? Oh, geez. Yeah, my mic was muted. <laughs> okay. Hello, great. everybody. Okay. Tonight's guest is Sean Blackwell, author of the book, Am I bipolar or just waking up? Since July of 2007, Sean has been creating an ongoing series of hyper slideshow videos which help people who've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder understand their experiences in non-ordinary states from a more positive, spiritually focused perspective. Borrowing heavily from the work of Dr. Stanislav Groff, Sean's work lets people know that when it comes to experiences of acute psychosis, they are far from alone and even have the potential to heal completely. Sean speaks from personal experience. During a self-help seminar, advertising executive Sean Blackwell entered a state of ecstasy so powerful he thought he had died and was headed for heaven. However, rather than being saved by God, Sean was arrested, handcuffed, and shipped to a psychiatric hospital where he was restrained and forcibly medicated during a brief but traumatic stay. Once released, Sean rejected any possibility that he had had a mental disorder. Instead, he began a search for the deeper meaning of his abrupt awakening. This may have been the best decision he ever made. His endless career struggles disappeared as his once mundane life blossomed into one of success, adventure, and intensity. It took a decade for Sean to finally discover that his once-in-a-lifetime blessing was actually quite common, but that those who experience it are usually diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Sean's book, Am I Bipolar or Waking Up?, takes readers inside his quest for a more authentic, purposeful life. His book is a paradigm shifter and offers hope to the thousands of people trying to make sense of their own misunderstood divine madness. Sean's message is as follows. Until now, society has treated bipolar disorder as a dangerous mental illness. However, for many people... It is also a potential for being a powerful opportunity. Stay with us, and we will bring Sean on and dive into this topic.
Yes, I am. Thank you, Sienna, uh, Christina, and Elizabeth. Um, there was a little bit of a feedback issue there. Is, is that resolved now? Oh, I will tell you, Sean, that we get feedback here, but we've been assured by Chris that it is actually not playing to the audience. Again, okay. we will all mute our mics as you're talking, but literally he has such great equipment that it gets screened out, so you don't have to worry that the... Uh, People listening to you are uh, hearing that horrible sound. Normally, they do not. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, then let me just continue and, and just say thank you. I appreciate the warm welcome. And, uh, yeah, I will say that in the beginning, um, when, I, when I started with this work in 2007, that a lot of family members I had were nervous about what I was doing. And, you know, some of the stuff I didn't talk about with people in my own family for 10 years, you know. And so then to come out and make YouTube videos about it was just, you know, chaos for, for people in my family. So it, I, I got used to it after a while, but uh, in the beginning, yeah, it was a bit of a, uh, took a step, you know. No, you're a, a trailblazer for uh, for all of us. Uh, coming out with this kind of thing and the depth that you're going to describe to us tonight and and being the man that you are now, um, that takes real courage, Sean. So I thank you. Now I'm going to jump in here, okay, ladies? I'm going to ask this first question. You okay. go for it, Zia. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we understand that you had this experience that not only changed your life, but your total understanding of mental illness, bipolar disorder, and spiritual awakening. What happened, Sean, in your life that put you on this journey? And take all the time you want. We have plenty of time. Okay. I'll, t I'll take some time then. And yeah. I guess before I even get into it, the, the sort of understanding of mental illness, as, as your listeners will hear, uh, did take time. It, it took a decade, you know, to, to, for sort of the lights to go on and for me to realize these connections. But to start, wow. what, what happened with me was in uh, March of 1996, I enrolled in a self-help seminar. Uh, some of you have probably heard of it called the Landmark Forum. And I joined this landmark forum because for my first four years in my career in advertising from like the time of like 26 to 30 or to 29, I was really going nowhere. I was completely stagnant. I didn't really enjoy what I was doing and I just couldn't seem to get a break into, into some career stream in that field that, that felt worthwhile. And so I, I felt like I was really going nowhere. So I took this course. And on the course, even though I was there basically to try and get a better job, uh, they brought up a lot of techniques, ways of looking at things that got me to look at my life in a, quite a different way in a very short period of time. Uh, they were applying concepts from Buddhism and uh, different forms of therapy. And many of it, or a lot of these techniques I'd heard of before, but I never really applied to myself. And so all of a sudden, when, when, when I'm hearing, you know, certain concepts coming and then I realize that, wow, you know, this has this profound impact on my life. And it really got me to see how, um, like, for example, that I would rather be right in certain relationships than actually preserve the relationship. You know, they, they talked about how we need to sort of defend our egos and, and defend our positions and opinions on things and, and showed us how that that, that often has a 
that often has a or plays a, a role in limiting our relationships. It gets in the way of our relationships. And I was doing that a lot of the time. I was one of those people that sort of always thought that they were right about everything. And maybe I still do, but a, a lot less than before. <laughs> um, so, it, <laughs> so anyways, um, uh, but it also got me to look at my family relationships differently. And I realized that, you know, there was a certain coldness and a rigidity coming from my mother towards me when I was young that had had quite a, a dramatic effect on my life that I didn't really realize until this course took place. It, my relationship with my mother made me feel like I was basically never good enough. And I have, mm-hmm. I think, compared to a lot of people, quite good parents, a stable family upbringing. And, and a lot of people would think, what, you're complaining about your parents? Your parents are perfect. But in yeah. some way, my mother being this perfect person was the sort of um, – made me feel inferior in a way. She was sort of a perfectionist kind of person. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so all of that came forward uh, in quite a short period of time, and I couldn't sleep. I was very excited when I would go home at night. And then a couple of days into this course, we did a meditation on fear. And basically just to just sit down and meditate on your own emotion of fear and at the beginning, I thought, well, this is going to go nowhere. I'm a very brave person. I, I've always thought of myself as courageous. And then all of a sudden, this fear came up related to a scuba diving accident uh, that I'd had just a couple of months earlier where I had almost died. And once I felt this sort of repressed fear from the scuba diving accident, then I was just sort of in another world. I, I came out of this meditation crying and that night when I went home, all of my senses had heightened. Um, details in the curtains were, were sharper. When I was combing my hair, I could hear the brush going through the comb, through the hair in a way I'd never heard before. Mm. Um, I could smell, you know, I talk about it in one of my videos. I could smell my own shit and it was, it just had an aliveness to it, you know. So you're in a, you know, you're already was, heading into an altered state, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was getting there, you know. I, I didn't really realize it. I just felt very alive. Um, uh-huh. And it even, it, it started to make me think that maybe I was in sort of a dream state or the whole world was like a dream. But mm. um, I was very emotional. My parents were worried, but I was having fun with it, right? Um, but then on the last day of this course, I, I had the conclusion that, wow, this is, this information that I've received, this knowingness, this this feeling of aliveness is, is maybe something I, I thought that I would only feel once I had died. And that's when it hit me that, you know, I was dead and, and that I had died in the scuba diving accident and then everything after that had been some sort of a purgatory phase to take me to the next level, you know. And this was all very funny to me that, wow, I'm, I'm looking at reality around me and it's all sort of an illusion. All these people are angels. They're not really people. And this all became quite funny. I thought, what an elaborate drama to put on for my salvation, you know. That's, that's sort of where I was at. You know, and um, so uh, I took myself into another room, a, a ballroom, a hotel ballroom, and prepared to in a sense, meet my maker, but I didn't know what I was going to meet. I, I thought maybe I was going to go into another dimension. Uh, I wasn't expecting to meet a man in a beard, but I thought that maybe I might meet spiritual beings. I, I had no idea. And then I went into this other room and started to go into this, you know, sort of exotic ritual. Um, and in that ritual, you know, I felt like I needed to let go of everything. And part of letting go of everything was I, I peed on the floor. I urinated on the floor of this hotel ballroom all over their beautiful, you know, carpets. You know, it was a five-star hotel. And then just <laughs> got down in it. Yeah, I got, I got down in that urine because I was afraid of going into the urine. And I, and I got right down in it. And I, I sort of laid there like Jesus on the cross. I had my arms spread out. And I just felt like I was going to ascend. And that's what happened. I started to feel myself energetically going up, ascending. And I thought I was leaving. You know, I, I thought I was leaving. But then once the energies all left, um, I was surprised to find myself still there. And, and then security guards came in. And I had taken my shirt off. They wanted me to put my shirt back on. And I refused to go in fear. And I refused to be manipulated. 
And so one thing led to another, and next thing you know, uh, the police are coming for me. And by that time, I was right down to my underwear, you know, um, because they'd asked me to get dressed. So I, in protest, I took everything off. And um, I was right down to my underwear. And then the police came and, and grabbed me and put me down on the ground and, and put handcuffs on me and took me to the ambulance, you know, put me in an ambulance. And I still thought I was going to heaven. I thought the whole thing was quite hilarious. I was like, wow, this is such an exotic journey that I'm on. This is really crazy. And uh, even in the psychiatric hospital, I thought the hospital itself was floating through space on its way to, you know, a parallel universe or something. Uh, but then once they started being mean to me and being very cold and forcibly injecting me with medication, I started to think differently that maybe what was happening was not what I thought. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, th things I thought, well, angels wouldn't do this to somebody. And, and so that started to break my delusion a little bit. Um, I fell asleep, uh, probably partially due to the medication. But I was ready to as, as well. I hadn't slept for a few nights. And uh, I think I slept for about 24 hours straight. And then when I woke up, I didn't really know where I was. But um, I knew what I needed to say. <laughs> which was that I'm in Toronto and the name is Sean Blackwell. So I told them all that they needed to hear. And then fortunately, after about four days, I was released. So I didn't have that long stay that, that many people do in that situation. And then I went home and for the next four to six months, uh, mostly stayed home quite quietly and tried to figure out what the hell happened to me, to be, <laughs> to be honest. You know, so that was the first thing. John, John, what the hell happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it took a while, you know. Um, it took a while, and I, for yeah. me, you know, they were telling me that I had a mental illness, you know, or they didn't tell me, they told my parents that I probably had this thing called bipolar disorder, which I'd never heard of, or schizophrenia, which I had heard of, but I just thought they had made a big mistake. I thought the psychiatrists were idiots. And I was just, I just had to get away from them and I'll be fine. And, and that's what happened. You know, they, I consider it to this day a misdiagnosis, but it wasn't until a year later. Well, it was a spiritual experience for me. I'll get into what happened a year later, a little later, but it was a spiritual experience for me. It ended four years of career frustration. I went back into my career, got a much better job over the next three years. Um, my salary tripled, you know, um, but really went in the direction I wanted to. And things just took off from there. And, and so that was sort of my big experience, okay? But at the so, time, I knew nothing about the connection between my, what happened to me and mental illness. It was like, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables. It was like a completely different thing, you know? Well, I think that that's a very important point, and for our listeners as well, because this is uh, the 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 uh, message here that there is an organic process of uh, breaking down and uh, building back up. We have been uh, brought up into a false artificial construct and made uh, personalities that are so disconnected from our, a really pure and honoring connection to the life force that some people go through the shadow land by having these kinds of experiences. And it's a way of, in a very brief time, really breaking the artificial structure so that some of the authentic, the real juice, the real life connection has a chance to reintegrate. You get to live from more of an authentic base. And this is what I see your experiences. I do believe that we all are attempting, those of us who are committed to Shadowland Voyagers and working uh, with these, with the artificial construct, breaking through that into a true connection to life. Some people go through it slowly and some people go through it in a ballroom, uh, you know, uh, wrestling in their own pee. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Everyone does it in their own way. But it's a sacred experience. It, it, it's a, it is a, a gift from life uh, asking us to purify and burn off what is false, what is against life. And I think it is happening in a fast and slow ways to many, many people 
right now all over this planet. And that's why I think your message is so important to bring to people because it is terrifying. This is not a pleasant, I mean, there were pleasant aspects, but it's also, uh, it could be hugely fearful. And uh, I think that we really want to encourage people to find places and ways to honor and accept however they transverse the shadow land and accept and love themselves through this and find um, the way to embrace what life is trying to give us here. I mean, to me, it's like a, a horrible, wonderful gift that, that was given to you and you've been brave enough to recognize, wow, not only, you know, you didn't just take medications and forget about it, but now you're really, really trying to sculpt this and offer it to many people. And uh, I think that that is an, a, a very worthwhile service. Uh, Christina and Elizabeth, I'm hogging the conversation here. You ladies uh, want to say anything at this point before we go on? I Sean? Actually, yeah, I actually do. This is Elizabeth. Um, Sean, I Hi. I didn't know that you were going to go into that detail of your life. And um, I found um, one of the most interesting parts of that part of the story the, the about you being handcuffed uh, when they were taking you away. And when you had started that weekend workshop, you came up with this um, feeling that you had felt handcuffed in life. And I, I, I bring up these, this synchronicity because it seems like when the synchronicities start is when this process begins. And, you know, I, I just kind of wanted to bring that up. That's kind of like a trigger or a recognition that something in one's life is changing. So, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll be honest, I didn't know I was going to go into that much detail either. <laughs> it just sort of popped out. Awesome. But, yeah, that, that I think my first chapter in my book is called Handcuffed. And, I mean, I joined that self-help seminar telling them, they said, why are you here? And I said, I feel completely handcuffed. You know, it just felt like I was trapped in my life and I, I couldn't get out. It was a, it was a prison. And then I left the seminar in handcuffs, you know, and I, and I felt fabulous. I was, and they asked me in the, they asked me in the ambulance, they said, do you want to roll over? You know, we can take the pressure off the handcuffs because I was actually laying on my wrists. So the handcuffs were digging into my wrist. And I told them, I said, no, I'm fine. Thanks. This is great. You know. I, I kind of like the police. Most people have a very traumatic experience with the police, but I don't know. Somehow we connected. I, I don't know why. <laughs> it, yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> I understand that feeling because you were kind of beyond the, the power games that usually go on in those scenarios, it seems. Yeah. And I, and I think, I think these police in particular had been sort of trained to deal with people that were in, that were crazy, that were in non-ordinary states. So they did have a certain sensitivity that I don't think you would get from most police officers. I, I consider myself lucky, you know, in some ways for how things broke. Because I could have very well wound up under the wrong circumstances. I could have been in the hospital for a month, you know. Thank you so much for sharing that with me, Sean. Well, yeah, I love that. After the break. Okay, we'll be back. Stay with us. Am I crazy or just waking up? Am I bipolar or just waking up? Find out. <laughs> <laughs> really loved that story. I loved your experience, Sean. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think the part, well, I loved all of it. <laughs> There's, it was Thanks, funny. Christina. It was, you know, heartfelt. It was real. It was raw. All the good stuff that makes a good story. <laughs> um, but it was real. It was your experience. I really love that um, you just really got in there and reclaimed some of your authentic energy and how alive you felt after that experience. It's like you got a part of yourself back and then your life 
totally took a turn for the better. And just that's so inspiring to me. Um, but I'm wondering what made you come out publicly, despite what your friends and family might have thought. I mean, this is a really, yeah, answer that question, please. Okay, okay, uh, I'll jump in. Well, you know, I went back to advertising. Sorry, the, I went back to advertising and. Well, sorry that I'm finding that sometimes that feedback is a little bit just, um, yeah, thanks. That's better. <laughs> I went back to advertising feeling like I, I didn't really want to continue with that as my career, but I don't know. Everything was right in front of me. So, so that's what I did. And then, uh, but I, I kept following my intuition because I, I wanted a more spiritual path in life. And one thing led to another. And I guess. Well, I, I had a dream that I was called to Peru and, and I just went about a year after I started working in it. And there I, I was on a shamanic trip. Um, and I met a Brazilian woman and we were born on the same day at the same time. And to make a long story short, we got married and moved to Brazil. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just making the bipolar link now. Maybe we can go back to that other stuff later. Uh, but so now I live in Sao Paulo, Brazil. You know, I left advertising. I started working as a teacher, uh, teaching English as a second language to executives down here. I enjoy it much more than I ever did advertising. It's a, it feels like a very real uh, connection I have with people. And so things went quite well, and I was just go, sort of going about my business. But I never really did find that spiritual calling, you know, and, you know, my wife would say to me, Ligia, Ligia her name is, it's a little hard for American ears, Ligia. Uh, she would say, you know, Sean, we, you had a dream to go to Peru. We met in Peru. Uh, we traveled the United States together. We traveled Brazil together. And then finally you decide to move to Sao Paulo and we move here to become English teachers. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's great. I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> and she says, it doesn't make sense. There's, there's more happening here, you know, cause she's got quite the shamanic streak in her. I'll, I'll tell you. But so she kept reminding me, you know, that we've got this spiritual calling, but we never really could find, you know, what it was. It, it just didn't seem to pop up. And, um, and in April of 2007, so we're talking about uh, 11 years later. Okay. 11 years after my crisis. Um, or opportunity, depending on how you look at it. Uh, 11 years later, I have a Brazilian niece who went into crisis uh, near Sao Paulo. And when I was hearing her, her symptoms, I, um, they, the family was saying that she was having uh, what they called referred to as bipolar disorder, and I didn't know what that was. And I hear symptoms over the phone, and I would think, well, that doesn't sound like bipolar disorder, or that doesn't sound like mental illness. That sounds like what I had. Um, you know, she had taken her clothes off or her blouse off in front of her father. She was very emotional. She had heightened sensory perceptions. Uh, she was also quite fearful, apparently more fearful than I was. But um, after about three or four days, apparently they had drugged her a lot. The psychiatrist had medicated her a lot, but sent her home, never hospitalized her. And we went up to work with her um, just to see what was going on. And what we found... Uh, was basically it was so similar to my experience. I, I told them that, hey, I said, she doesn't need this medication. She just needs to be supported and work through this, you know, and, and, and that's what we should do. But the family wasn't convinced and they kept her on the medication. And so I spent the next four months, uh, d like investigating on, especially, especially on the internet, but then also through further research from, from books, et cetera, other psychologists. Um, what this difference was between what I had considered that I had, this sort of spiritual emergency, spiritual awakening thing, uh, and a mental disorder, especially bipolar disorder. And what I found out online is that for many people diagnosed with bipolar disorder, that their symptoms are almost identical to what I went through. Uh, sometimes they are identical to what I went through. And at that moment, I thought that, you know, previous to my niece having her experience, I thought my experience was something that maybe one in 20,000 people go through. You know, I might meet two people in my life or maybe three in my whole life that had an experience similar to what I went through. But then all of a sudden in that moment, I realized it was like one in 20, one in 30 people are going through experiences like this. And I, I just wow. felt like I had to do something. It was just like, I felt like the guy in Schindler's List who felt like he needed to save all the Jews, you know? Bless your heart. Thank you. Incredible. 
Okay. Did you want to say something, Elizabeth? Okay. Oh, uh, no, I think that was Christina. Oh, I just, yeah, that was, I just wanted to know what um, called him, called you forward. And I think that was just amazing because you had the personal experience and you had the experience with someone else. And you said, hey, <laughs> there's something more to this. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you're out there and doing the work that you're doing because I do think that, um, you know, these mystical experiences, if you want to call it that, awakening, um, call it that, is definitely on the rise. Do you feel that is true as well? Oh, it's a global phenomenon. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah, and, and when, you, when you talk to regular people, I'm getting feedback again. When, when you talk to regular people uh, about these sort of things, you would be surprised at how many people start to open up to you and share experiences uh, very similar but that didn't require hospitalization, that they just had a moment in their life where they thought they were losing their mind and, and their senses changed and, and they were taking in, you know, non-earner experiences, but that it was digestible. And so they were sort of able to go back to their regular life. But, you know, there's a lot of other people that that's not happening to. It, it's it's a more severe situation that needs a lot of support and compassion, you know. Yeah, so what would you recommend to someone that's going through a more severe case of, you know, awakening? Yeah, well, the number one thing is to watch my videos. I think that's the first thing is, is it took me, you know, um, I've got more videos to make, but I've been making these videos for four and a half years now. Uh, there's about 40 and 25 of them are slideshows that really talk about the theory that helped me understand my experience. So I share a lot of the theoretical ideas of some really leading edge pioneering doctors and especially Dr. Uh, Czech doctor uh, Stanislav Grof, who's one of the founders of transpersonal psychology. And basically once you get into his books, everything you see in acute psychosis is explained there. And he understands the difference between the experiences that are beneficial in healing and some of the experiences that may require medication and are definitely not healing, okay? Because not everything in insanity is a healing process. Can you d dive into that? Can you clarify that? I, I'm sure this is a vast topic, uh, Sean, but uh, can you clarify, can we talk about what part of it was the healing for you, what part of these experiences for people are an attempt to heal from, uh, well, what as I see is a massive false construct that we bought into that uh, doesn't allow us really to live. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I would like to hear your awareness about, uh, because uh, what exactly you found, what shadow parts were so uh, constricting your life force, those are my, that's my languaging, um, that they it had to be uh, shattered in such a uh, dramatic way. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that there's two uh, key aspects to these experiences. And one is what I would call your ego, your, your, the way your ego is. And, and I like to use Eckhart Tolle's analogies because they're quite easy to understand, and he just refers to your ego as the false self, okay? These are the things in your life that you think you are that thing, but you're really not. So, for example, uh, if you really identify yourself as, well, I am, my name is Sean, I am Canadian, I am a good student, I have two loving parents, um, you know, I will be a success one day, a career success one day, you know, I am a good person, you know, and, and you take all those labels and um, when you have events in your life that start to threaten those labels that you identify yourself with, people get scared because when you threaten someone's ego, it's the same as threatening their survival. There's a fear of death that's going on there. You know, when you, when you start to take those dreams away, when you start to take those identities away. And so I would say that for pretty much everybody – that an acute psychosis, which is legally or what psychiatry would call my experience, an acute psychosis, and, and I think they would agree with this, that it is a collapse of the ego, 
Okay. Now, ironically, in Buddhism, they say that in order to fully develop as a human being, that you need to get rid of the ego. But at the same time, we need an ego. So it's, it's quite a complex subject. It, I, I would just say that when that ego collapses, you know, you're completely out of control. And, and you're, you're going to do things like take off your clothes because you've lost your sense of shame. Um, and, you know, a lot of other crazy wild behaviors. So that's why we need an ego to sort of get through the day. But once that ego is collapsed, there is an opportunity for a expansion of that ego to take place and an opportunity to dive into that shadow that you're talking about. Okay, and because those shadow elements, once the ego's collapsed and you're in that non-ordinary state, the shadow elements start to surface as needed. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, Sean. In my book, Stealing the Moon, uh, it's about a psychologist that is taking somebody through a psychotic break without drugs and medication. That's how the book begins. But she, uh, her shadow parts come out. And she freaks him out, and he flips out even harder. And this is what sends her on her journey into her shadow. And um, how it was described to me many years ago is that some people will dismantle the false self gradually, and some people, the the rigidity of the prison cell that, that has been created as that egoic structure is so tight, it left in so little life force that it has to be demolished in this kind of uh, psychotic experience way. Uh, it's terrifying uh, for all of us, whether it's slow or fast. And yet, here we are at this point in human evolution where this is actually not necessarily we will all go through psychotic breaks or what you experienced, but in some fashion, this is what is being required. This is what life is delivering to us as we go into this huge energetic shift. The life force is screaming to be reintegrated in a new integrity within humanity. And so uh, this topic is just uh, so uh, important because we are so fearful. And here is a man who's gone through a really rough experience I mean, I know it was also joyous, but but you went through the fast lane. You know, you went through the nine eleven. The 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 explosives <laughs> went up. The building came down. You know, twenty seconds, it was over. You were yeah. raw life force, just on that yeah. ride. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Sienna, you know, for my family who was actually right there, you know, this was a catastrophe. This was the worst catastrophe of their life. You know. This was a really serious thing. So, you know, wow. I, I, it, it was wonderful for me. And I was telling them they didn't need to worry about me. You know, I'm perfectly fine. Even if they send me to the mental hospital for the rest of my life, I'm perfectly fine. <laughs> you know, but for them, I mean, it was just devastating. Mm. Well, this did is what feel, I was going to ask, did you feel liberated after that from those handcuffs that you felt that life had around you? Oh, yeah, I, I was... I felt, I pretty much felt liberated from that point where I was going to drive the bus on my life. Like this, this was going to be, I, I was going to do it. You know, I was going to make my choices. I was going to make my mistakes. And I wasn't nearly as afraid of failure um, as I was previously. I just, I just got in the game, you know, and, and I think that I had sort of had a more guarded approach to living. Um, I was really, um, I, I had just started to open up in the, the two years prior, but, you know, the guy coming out of university, I was a totally rational, I was living in that rational box, you know, and it was killing me. You know, it was, it was really killing. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie with Michael Douglas called Falling Down. Have any of you seen that movie from the 80s? No. He just, no. he just plays this really, um, you know, pardon my French, anal guy who, who's just so rigid. And when I used to go to, when I used to go to uh, work in the morning, you know, I used to wear my hair like this guy sometimes. And, and I'd look in the mirror and I would think, I'm that guy. I'm, I'm the, the guy in that movie that winds up shooting everybody at the end, you know, like, I think he did shoot everybody at the end. I, I was not in a good place, you know, I was just so, I was just so in the box, you know. And now you feel like your life, you, that you are more authentic and as, as is your life, it sounds. 
Yeah, you know, I'm uh, how they say I'm keeping it real. <laughs> I do my best, you know. We all have our bad days, I suppose, but but I do my best. Well, you're minimalizing that, and yeah, well, I mean, we're not trying to paint you as as a great hero, although I think really in some ways you are. But and the beautiful thing is now you're just a, a regular guy. But you know that was the journey of Pinocchio, through all of what he went through to become a real person. A real person isn't egoic, isn't some flashy character. He's real. Mm-hmm. One of the one of the things I was going to bring up too about you know about these sort of spiritual experiences and there's a great woman named Catherine Lucas who's written a book called In Case of Spiritual Emergency. Her name is Catherine Lucas. And, you know, one of the points she makes in her book is that once you've been through a process like this, um, it can be, you, you, the life you lead afterwards can be quite unassuming. You know, in some ways, the sort of ego uh, ambitions start to go down a little bit. And so that all of a sudden you can say to yourself, well, instead of being, uh, vice president of an ad agency one day, I think I'd rather be an English teacher, you know, in Sao Paulo and make maybe 30% of what I would be making if I stayed in the business, you know, if I stayed in the advertising business. You, you, you can make those choices because intuitively they feel better for you and you're more interested in keeping yourself satisfied, peaceful, living with yourself than being a fraud, being a successful fake, you know. And I really did feel when I was in advertising like I was a fake, you know. It's as though we, we change our values and the process continues as the values begin to change. You know, you keep working on the process of integrating, but the values, like, seem to organically change once that initial plug is released, that valve that kept you in the box or you know you unlock that door at least that's sure sure yeah and we we can't get into it too much but what's really interesting when you look at work like in spiral dynamics the evolution of consciousness um ken wilbur a guy like that is that how our values shift really comes in sequence you know um when like you'll notice that all gangsters you know all kind of mafia people um Their lives are about respect, you know. It's about getting respect, earning respect, and having respect from other people. Not love, respect. And that means fear, you know. So they want people to fear them, you know, because they see the world as a very fearful place. And that's what their value system is based on. But then as people develop, those values evolve, you know. And you have, for example, religious people live in a very a very moral world of good and evil, and you're supposed to sort of fulfill your obligations. That's what religious people do. And then modern people who are into business, you know, their 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 whole thing is about success and living independently and, and being on your own. And then what you see in this postmodern movement is that people are much more about diversity. This is the big value in in postmodernity is listening to other cultures, listening to other ideas, and really trying to bring some social harmony to this, you know. And and the values continue to evolve, you know. Uh, the values continue to evolve past that. So I it really is about values. I think the the life of of the the path of no love gets really boring after a while. <laughs> And I think that's yeah. why people are going, wait a minute, there's got to be more to life than this. But yeah, and I think a lot of people, especially in the United States, you know, like when you look at that Occupy Wall Street movement, you know, that was a movement that for the first time in history, Americans were questioning, you know, what are we doing as a society? You know, because Wall Street was the epitome of society. That's where our Harvard graduates go, you know, and all of a sudden we're saying this isn't right, you know. It's a big shift. Yes, absolutely. And uh, so you life put you in the um, in the big shift on steroid zone, uh, and <laughs> we are, you know, and you're you're the poster boy for it, really. But we're all in there together. I mean, it feels like we're in the birth canal, and it's getting uh, it's he, it's getting more and more intense and painful. Uh, if we're holding on to any of these values that are not serving life any longer, you talk about that. You you say that you're very grateful that you went through this, uh, but there were there was a 
there were some shadow aspects. There was some suffering involved and there was some purification. And you talk about the purification aspect. And I would like to, to have a bit of a discussion here about that, of what this was uh, in terms of um, coming out, going through the tunnel, coming out the other side. There are stages you talk about this kind of a ritual. Um, is any of that resonating with you at all? Well, I, I remember, um, maybe, maybe this is what you're talking about. You know, there is this aspect that's extraordinarily mystical to these experiences if they're supported. And this was my own experience as well is that you go into a regression period, a spontaneous regression. And many people report experiences of traveling back to the beginning of time. And I had that experience as well. I, I started to, um, identify with apes. And I, I saw, you know, the movie 2001 Space Odyssey, you know, where they sort of have that big black monolith and they're that's surrounded by these sort of primal apes. You know, it, it was like I was going back to the beginning of time. I, I even started making ape noises in the hospital. You know, people it's reported in, in Stan Groff's work that people have these strong uh, affinity connections with moments in their own life from the from the past like their childhood moments from your birth the birth process and then even beyond that to strong connections with other times other places people and cultures where it seems that we seem to carry in our dna or our soul system or whatever you want to call it we seem to carry remnants from i don't know different parts of humanity in in this life here and that some of that gets cleaned out in this uh, uh, regression process, which psychiatry stops completely, you know. But this is the Shadowland, all the fragmented, unintegrated things that were too terrifying to experience fully when they happened. We have to go back and experience parts of our own collective and personal history that uh, we could not integrate because they were not fully experienced. So this is uh, what you're going through is the reintegration, which is what Jung talked about in the birth of the self through this uh, con- birth canal that can be very painful. Anyone knows that when they've given birth, or when they have uh, remembered their birth, uh, the moments before birth are a- often agonizingly painful. You don't think you're going to survive. You think you're dying rather than being born. It, and then, boom, the new birth is out. Mm-hmm. And And people, I think that if you haven't seen it, it sounds quite abstract or unreal, but, you know, we had a chance to work with a guy uh, close to Sao Paulo here, and he, after like 10 minutes of meditating, he started to spontaneously go into a regression, and after vomiting about 12 times in his in his own home bathroom, um, he went into a birth regression, and this, and then the, the, a series of regressions started, and eventually he ran into a bedroom and put himself in the closet. And now, why did he go in the closet? He went into the closet because when he was young, he was sent to an orphanage where when they punished him, they used to put him in the closet. And my wife went in after him and got in the closet with him, and he didn't know who she was. He, he said, who are you? And my wife said, I'm your angel. <laughs> and they stayed in that closet for about an hour as he started to work through things that happened to him when he was six years old. Um, they were in that room together for about two hours. And when he came back, he didn't remember anything. He had no recollection of what happened to him. But all he knew was that he felt a lot better. Yes, because that part was integrated. It was no, he no longer had to. Beautiful. Yeah, I keep hearing a recurring theme of the importance of being supported through, you know, a type of experience like this, whatever degree it shows up, and um, that the experience needs to be validated um, somehow. Uh, and I feel that, too. That's why we're doing this show, really. But um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the from the moment you go into a psychiatric hospital, your experience is being invalidated. And uh, people have found, like research has shown, that in order to heal, you know, the most important thing is is if you can get with in a safe, protective environment with people who who can actually support your experience, um, 
and validate it for you and bring what they consider a feeling of presence or being. We don't do something to somebody. We just be with them. Almost like a midwife. Mm, Absolutely. Beautiful. Beautiful, Sean. We're going to break again and we will meet you on the other side of the birth canal. I mean, the break in a couple of minutes. Stick with them. Shadow them. Be brave. Welcome back, Shadowland Voyagers. Your experience, perception, and questions are deeply appreciated here. Join the conversation. Call in at 213-233-3998 or 888-832-2027. Welcome back. We're with Sean Blackwell, and he's talking about his story, which is beautiful. Um, we wanted to kind of touch on a little bit about what your work looks like right now. Um, you said you were uh, teaching English and, and that kind of thing, but every once in a while, someone might bring someone your way to work with in that uh, instinctive way that you know so well. So I kind of wanted to ask uh, you know, what your experiences are working with other people and what that's been like for you. Okay, Christina. Well, as I said, you know, I I was working with my younger niece um, here in Brazil, and you know, she was being medicated, and, and I was getting prepared to go back to her parents and say, "Look, it, you know, they're telling her that she's going to be on medication for a minimum of two years. The reality will most likely be that she'll be medicated for life. That that's what's going to happen. And when that happens, give us an opportunity to work with her again because I think we can." We can help her and, and get her through. And I've done enough research to think that it was possible. But what happened was, just as I was ready to do that, her sister came back from Europe, and I guess she just got in the middle of the whole mix. And for the first time in her life, she went into a, a crisis. You know, she, first it started with a phase of mania, and she started to write in lipstick on her bedroom walls. And then she started after a few days, she started to have a full out of body experience. And we took care of that in our apartment, which I do not recommend taking care of people in an apartment, but we really had no place to take her. And after my feeling of losing, you know, her sister, I just, I wasn't sending this girl to the hospital. I mean, that was not going to happen. I'd worked too hard. We were going to get her through. And so we took her to our apartment here. And, you know, this girl did not feel pain for three days. She was bumping into walls and, and things like that and, and actually suffered a few bruises because of it. And she didn't feel anything. Her, her, I, I guess her soul was just so far out of her system that she was just in ecstasy for, you know, the first 24 hours, you know. Um, and then we stayed with her for the next or three or four days. Then she started to get grounded again. 
And to make a long story short, that first process was very important. After that, we got her a transpersonal psychologist, and she would go on to have a couple of more crises. But as opposed to what happens with psychiatry, where the crises tend to get more severe if people go off the medication and every subsequent uh, psychosis gets worse and worse, in her case, the subsequent psychoses, because they were supported, they got milder and milder. And so now she's doing her master's degree in, in Europe right now, and she hasn't been medicated or had a relapse for three years. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we'll be right back. Beautiful, beautiful the value of supporting people. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. talking about am I bipolar or waking up? We all here? Yes, I'm here. Good. Oh, yes. Sean, you, uh, we've, we've gone into some extent uh, the uh, effects of the normal way that uh, the uh, psychiatry and psychology treats uh, uh, this experience. But I'd like to dive into it a little deeper because there are many people all over the world right now who are having uh, friends and relatives and children going into this experience. Of course, it's frightening and it must be incredibly challenging. But what, in your opinion, is the normal way that uh, people are being normal? I mean, the, uh, the construct method of treating these people and what is the impact on the quality of their experience? As they're going through these experiences. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, I'm just having the intuition that I would like to just take a step back a little bit and say how things were dealt with about maybe 200 years ago, 150 years ago. You uh, go wherever you wish. Okay. To to sort of make an interesting point, I, I think, and that is that, you know, back before we really had science and we were living in very much a, a religious world of, of anything uh, in, in Europe and, and in the United States, you know, electricity, nothing like that, and very, very little science. And when people had a mental disorder in this moment in time, it was usually considered that they had the devil inside them. There was an evil spirit, an evil presence you know, and, and that's what was going on. And, and a lot of people would, for example, experience an exorcism. They would be taken to a priest and have an exorcism done. So how people were treated was basically they were treated as sort of evil. And then they would, if they had institutions available, um, often they would be locked in psychiatric institutions, where ba- which were basically like prisons. Okay, So that was where we were in the sort of pre-scientific era. Then when psychiatry came along, it, it especially you know around the German psychiatric movement, which which sort of came up with the Nazis, they really did look at people with mental disorders as being genetically inferior, and mentally ill people were sent to the gas chambers, you know, during World War Two and, and World War One. I'm not sure about World War One, but in World War Two, certainly sent to the gas chambers because they wanted to eliminate all these weak people from society. You know, so when you're looking at psychiatry today, it does have this lineage of thinking that you're a genetically inferior person if you have a, a psychosis. Okay, and there's tremendous coldness with with how they treat you because of that. They refuse to connect with you. They look at you as an object that needs to be controlled. And so then in the 1950s and, and 60s started to come the psychiatric medications and and really, you know, starting in, I guess, the 1970s or mid-60s, early 70s, some of these psychiatric medications, even though they had horrific side effects, um, they did allow people to a certain extent to live a, a somewhat normal life, you know, even though that, that life was somewhat limited, the quality of life was limited, there was a lot of side effects. 
and so I, I see it as, okay, maybe it was a step forward, better than being considered evil or, or people thinking that you have an evil spirit. Now you, you're considered to have a genetic problem, you know, and, and most people have heard of the chemical imbalance. You know, you've got either too much serotonin or too much dopamine happening in your system. And so today what happens is if you've had any sort of non ordinary experience, you go to a psychiatrist and you're going to get medicated. And the medications they give you um, – they can produce uh, short-term benefits. People can feel like, wow, I'm back to normal. I've got my life back. I can function. I can, I can live my life. I can hang on to my wife and kids. You know, I can stay out of jail. You know, so, so there are these short-term benefits. But in the long term, there is um, a lot of side effects, you know, brain damage, kidney damage, liver damage, uh, skin conditions, you know, aging. And along with that, the, the self-esteem issues of, you know, every time you take that pill, it's a message to yourself that you're mentally ill. So as opposed to my approach and the approach of the doctors that I follow, which is one of validating the experience and working with it, if at all possible, you know, the first thing from psychiatry is to invalidate the experience, pathologize it, and stop it. And once you stop that thing, then then there's really no turning back. So once you stop it, uh, then it's harder to resolve, come through to the other side. You're saying it's better once it begins, to get people right when it begins. Is that correct? Yeah, once you stop the process, um, you, you've sort of paralyzed the process. In some ways, well, it will be harder to heal in the future, and it just... Every time you try and go off those medications in the future, it's it's going to get tougher and tougher, you know. So if anybody is considering, if the, if anybody out there is medicated and they're considering going off their medications, uh, watch my videos. Uh, go to my website at bipolarwakingup.com. We'll, we'll repeat it later and get some more information on how to reduce your meds safely because it can be a very dangerous process, you know. Basically, if you stop your medication immediately. Uh, or within two weeks, then you're almost guaranteeing yourself a psychosis, you know, and one that's harder to deal with. So what do you recommend? Oh, Christina, did you want to say something? Well, I was just going to say, um, in your book, you say that you reached a, a tentative hypothesis that bipolar mania is like a psycho-spiritual vomiting, um, and that that process needs to continue until the completion or return. So you're saying... Now that if someone is medicated, they're still going to have to deal with that stuff eventually. Correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And just the other night, I was talking to a woman who's who's been hospitalized a couple of times, but she's really prepared herself intellectually. And I used that analogy again about the volcano. And in her case, I said, well, look, why don't we try, you know, meditating and seeing if we can get that energy to come up through meditation, but in such a slow way that it sort of gradually comes off, you know, and, and maybe we talk about that a little bit later. It's, it's, um, it's not something I've seen in action yet, but I'm expecting that if people are able to meditate regularly, that that could be the first step towards healing. But let's, let's save that for a little bit later. That, that steam needs to come off though. The volcano needs to explode. Yeah. Yeah, it's so difficult when people have been uh, down the uh, medical pathway and now this thing is locked deep in their uh, tissue and kind of jammed and corroded and it's, it's, um, and, and there's so few places of support. Are there any places that people can go to, Sean? When, that are safe, that are supportive, that are understanding, that see the, the, some kind of sacred dimension or at least humane treatment of this situation? And what is the situation in the world right now? We know that the, uh, the, the experience is on the rise, but what about places where people can go? Yeah, well, you mentioned the sacred dimension, which, which I think is interesting. I really see us in the very, the, the, the beginnings of the birth process of this whole thing. And, and let me give you an example. You know, I follow Dr. Stanislav Grof's work. He understands this work completely. And his director, Tav Sparks, opened a clinic last year, two, two or three years ago, I think it was, uh, down in North Carolina called Fires Creek. And they worked with enough people. Um, especially through addiction problems, that he could see 
that the supportive process was working. And he told me to my face, he said, Sean, it works. But the problem was that financially they couldn't get it working and they couldn't get over the legal restrictions and the legal hurdles that, that we have to deal with in our culture right now. And, and I'll give you one little example of, of this type of obstacle, which is that, you know, from a therapeutic standpoint today, it is illegal to touch your clients. I mean, you, you can't do it in a lot of places. Um, you, you risk being sued and, you need to allow, in a supportive experience, you need to allow for very intimate, you know, supportive relationships where, you know, to be honest, and this might sound controversial, but there could be situations where one person removes their clothes entirely in a psychosis and then comes to a support person for a hug and asks for a hug, you know, and provided it doesn't, you know, really cross sexual boundaries. You know, that, that hug, I believe that that hug should be given if the person feels that they can do it. You know, that, that, that intimate contact, if it's asked for, should be supplied. And, and in a very loving but sacred way. I mean, to abuse that situation is just, I think, the worst crime imaginable. But, you know, it's, if there's, if there's two or three support people in the room, it's pretty hard to, you know, sexually abuse somebody in front of other people. So, you know, that's a way to keep things safe. But, you know, that kind of contact needs to happen. And our culture just, you know, it doesn't accept that right now. That's a huge thing. And this is where we often talk about uh, bringing the balance of the feminine qualities back out of the dominator culture, which is cut, that has demonized touch and sensuality and feeling and intuition and sensuality. And these are the things that are trying to come back online that a person feels so repressed, so cut off from the life force, and to make uh, it demonize and make illegal the healer, which is love, to make it illegal. Uh, this is why I stopped being a psychologist, frankly, because uh, although it has to, of course, be in appropriate bounds, and I'm not talking about um, having sex with clients. I, I, I don't think that that's appropriate at all, but... Uh, we are now so paranoid because we've so suppressed uh, society and there are so many pedophilias, there are so many sex offenders, there's so much perversion because there are no legal uh, natural outlets left for these energies to express. And then we just keep trying to create more and more rules that are creating more and more control and there's no place for us to return to life. And this is a huge, huge problem. It's true that love is the healer, and I found the same thing in working with uh, people going through psychotic breaks. They need to be physically contacted to allow the experience to keep flowing and moving. And when that is broken, this is where they often get stuck and they get trapped. Yes, when I when I worked with my older niece, I had my hand touching her, um, most of the time holding her hand, sometimes my hand was on her forehead, sometimes she put my hand on her stomach, and then sometimes she just hugged me. I mean, just wrapped her arms around me and, and like hung on for dear life, you know, and, and I was probably in physical contact with her 90% of her episode, and the rest of the time I was sleeping, you know, while, while my wife was in physical contact with her as well. And that, that contact also, it's, it's a grounding thing, you know. It lets them know that, you know, they've got a real body, that there's someone here with them that's going through this with them together, you know. It's, it's a very reassuring thing. And fortunately, when I was in my episode in the hospital, my father, I constantly was asking my father to keep his hand on my back. Put your hand on my back. I, my father's hand felt very reassuring and, I don't know why he was able to maintain his cool, but I, I think that was part of my healing process as well as having a hand. And, you know, one of, one of the worst things that happens to people in, in the psychiatric hospital is when they get put in isolation. I mean, it's just an extraordinarily traumatizing thing for some people because you're so sensitive. You know, this is the microcosm of the macrocosm of the entire uh, cultural grid construct that we're in. And how the sickness, the pervasive sickness uh, that we all bear, because this touch deprivation, it, it comes to all of us from uh, a, uh, you know, pure, in America, we're based on puritanical culture and patriarchal culture that has demonized touch itself and made it a perversion, and it is our connection and the way that we do integrate these shadow aspects 
and it's one of the major control mechanisms of the of those uh, the powers that were or are ending hopefully is this is a huge control mechanism to not allow us to find our natural midwife route one with the other in creating this kind of real support through touch mm-hmm. and i think especially for women you know and i guess i never paid attention when i was in canada but you know, I lived here in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I'm sure you see it in Ecuador. I mean, women love to touch. They love to touch people when they're talking to them. They're touching each other all the time down here. And complete strangers, they'll meet each other in the street. They'll get in a conversation. And the next thing you know, they're holding hands, you know. Um, there's a there's a much more natural, feminine vibe for women in, in, I think, these Latin American countries that just makes it, okay, there's a little bit more sexism too, but it's just, I think, a little bit easier to just be a woman down here in Latin America than it is in the United States and Canada where you've got so many restrictions on you. It's true. The uh, women, the sisters, they they hold hands. They walk down the street all the time. Young ones, old ones, they're, they're always touching and you can see the happiness. And the, these are people that don't have anything. There's never going to be upward mobility from many, many of their lives. It's just never going to happen. And they have nothing. And they're poor. And these people are happy. And you can feel their bodies because they are touched and cuddled and fondled in healthy ways, for the most part, their whole life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to idealize, you know, Brazilian culture, but certainly in that part, you know, I, I think there's a, um, a profound difference, you know. I really do think that especially women are really getting, I don't know, boxed in, locked up by American culture. You know, it's, it's pushing them to perform in, in ways that, you know, I, I just don't think it's, I, I don't think it serves the natural feminine vibe, the way they're being pushed into careers and success. And and I don't think equality means acting like men. And I, I think that's where they're being pushed to be. Yeah. And at the end of the day, this is what all of this uh, uh, journeys through the shadow and are into our authentic selves. And sometimes those selves are very, very simple, basic selves, but we've been denied the access to them. And this is a huge well, it's a huge sickness. It's certainly a huge pain that we all carry. Elizabeth, you have a question for here. I would really like you to ask that at some point. Are, are you there? I am here. <laughs> which which one? What is it regarding? Please, please speak to your feelings of the shift we are experiencing here on Mother Earth and possible mass awakening. Any comments or suggestions concerning being of service to others facing this sh- I mean, that's jumping ahead. Maybe that's too fast. You want to go somewhere else, Sean? That's fine. But I would like to take uh, this uh, bipolar uh, just waking up into a, a sense of the global awakening and how, how you uh, res- feel about that. Okay. Well, you know, one of the things... Wow, we've got a minute and 30 seconds to talk about this global shift. <laughs> well, we can come back. All right. Maybe you just want uh, to take a minute to tell them how to contact you again briefly, and we can come back with that. That's fine. I know we at the end of the show we'll also, but uh, how do they get hold of you, Sean? Let's tell them now before we go out to break. Okay. Well, I really recommend, you know, looking at my videos first. That's sort of where people really know me best, and they're all on YouTube. Um but you can access everything from my website at www.bipolar, excuse me, bipolar or waking up.com. And that's all one word, bipolar or waking up. And there you'll see my book, uh, access to my videos. I also do some consulting for people sometimes. If, if people are sort of in an episode and they, they want to talk, I, I do some of that for a reasonable fee. And I've got some extended resources as well, uh, including something, Sienna, you asked me about earlier was any support networks and things like that. I, I have one link uh, to finding a therapist. And it's a Canadian... A website called Spiritual Emergency Service, Spiritual Emergency Service, and they've got links for cool therapists and support centers all over the world. So that's all on my website, bipolar or waking up.com. Great. Thank you so much. Stay with us. We'll be back for our final round with Sean Blackwell.
and myself, Sienna Leah. We're here with Sean Blackwell, and we're talking about the implications of your experience here uh, to the uh, global shift that uh, this mass awakening that everyone's talking about, 2012, people are talking about this stuff, Sean, but what's your perspective on it? Okay, well, you know, I'm a big fan of Ken Wilber's work to start, um, and I've studied the evolution of consciousness quite a bit. And, you know, when you look at the history of the planet, you know, we were in what you might consider archaic consciousness, you know, just trying to survive on this planet for uh, thousands of years, you know, like hundreds of thousands of years. And then came tribes, you know, and, and then you had this sort of tribal thing happening for, you know, tens of thousands of years. And then, you know, the... um Early civilizations came, like the Roman Empire and the Greeks and, and this sort of thing. And then came agrarian society, which was about a thousand years ago. You started to get, you know, what you would consider farmers and farmlands and that sort of thing. And, and with every one of those shifts, the, the values would change, you know. And when, you know, the first world, like Canada, the United States, Europe, when they came into the turn of the century, Probably 90, 95% of people were living in a, a traditional, very religious mindset. You know, that, that's where people were a hundred years ago. Uh, it was a world of good and evil and you listened to your authority figures and, you know, the priests had a lot of power, ministers had a, had a lot of power in people's lives and most people lived like that. And then after World War, you know, so we had, very long periods where people wouldn't see any change in society. Then, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, we've got this sort of agrarian society that was quite dominant. And then all of a sudden we have modern society, which explodes during after World War II. You know, that really just sort of comes out. And then in the 60s, we have the first inkling of postmodern society, which which really doesn't take hold until the 90s. Right. And then now we're, we find people shifting into integral uh, consciousness and in even higher levels of consciousness seem to be coming through as well. So you've got these, you know, three or four levels of consciousness, you know, three or four different value systems, different ways of looking at the world, which have all come through just in the last hundred years. And so when you think about that, that, you know, the whole history of mankind, we had like three different levels of consciousness. And then for the last hundred years or 150 years, we've had four levels of consciousness come through. It, it seems pretty clear that, you know, on, on a consciousness level, a values level, we're just accelerating at an incredible pace. And, and I think that that, you know, being able to track that evolution sociologically gives concrete proof to the fact that we are evolving as spiritual beings. Absolutely. And uh, my God, just integrating that much uh, accelerated experience is pro- probably uh, why there are so many people that are being called to the shadow land, either the fast lane or the slow lane, because we are uh, also we seem to be in a race with either extinction or uh, a whole new golden age. You know, which way are we going? And uh, a, a lot of us are looking to the external for that. But it seems to me that your experience, and I imagine there are millions of people going through similar experiences all over this globe, it's that life itself, which I often just call the mother, is, is augmenting a huge push through the birth canal. All the experiences, the integration for this incredible, a lot of people call it an ascension process with the, with the mother earth herself. People see it in different ways. But there's something in the internal, and we, don't, we it seems to be the last thing we want to deal with because it's scary, it's intimidating, it's uh, all-encompassing, it threatens to destroy all the falseness and bring forth and integrate all the valuableness of all those stages, it seems to me, that that's what you're describing. Mm-hmm. Is the birth and, and of I a think, new humanity, and that we're yeah. in the birth canal, and that this is the birth process, and then here we come in with the controllers who are trying to abort the birth, and this is what we want to get this message out: Don't let the birth of your authentic self uh, be aborted, because you have probably been at this for thousands of uh, thousands of years. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I also think that, you know, if you're looking at it in terms of an evolutionary sense that, you know, as much as I don't like psychiatric medications, I, I can see that they play a role. And some people, you know, uh, their experiences are just too disturbing for them to handle. A lot of people get paranoid. And in, in, par- in situations of paranoia, um, you probably should be medicated. It's your least worst option. I, I would consider, you know, a, a person who's paranoid at least worse option. These experiences can be frightening to people. And so we have medications, which I hope in the future we get more sophisticated at using, like using uh, homeopathic doses, very small doses, helping people sleep. But, you know, just giving them enough medita- medication to facilitate the process, you know, that take some of that fear away so that it can be dealt with. It's true because people have had so little support in terms of their life structure in a loveless uh, culture, a dominator culture where it's survival of the fittest. They don't have the, the, uh, the organic grid to hold them. And so these things are hurling through and then they can get into a very unsupported area and this is, can cause huge paranoia. It's unfortunate. It's exceedingly painful that. Um, Elizabeth and uh, Christina, is there anything at this point you would like to ask, Sean? Well, I'd like to actually talk a little bit more about that subject because this is right up my alley. (laughs) Um, You know, when I was about 14 and a half or 15, um, I was having a breakdown. I I was hearing voices and all kinds of uh, voices telling me to basically commit suicide. I mean, I, I was there was something in the ethers trying to do me in, <laughs> basically. And I okay. I went to my therapist because I, w- I was going to weekly therapy, and I just said, "Look, I'm hearing voices, and I'm you know uh, having these experiences." And uh, you know, their answer was. Um, you know, well, we'll send you to a psychiatrist and, and, and let you talk to that person. And so I thought, oh, good, a person who really wants to hear what I have to say. Because she, she just wasn't very interested. And so I go to the psychiatrist and, and he says, well, okay, tell me what's going on. So I tell him, the, you know, the, oh, the basics. I talk maybe five minutes. And he says, well, let's get you on some antidepressants. Now, this is not and I think it was about 86 or 87. And I just told the guy, I said, look, I just want to have open communication with someone who can kind of direct me through this because I'm having these experiences. And, uh, you know, he said, well, you're, you're, you know, the best I can do for you is, is, you know, recommend that you, you know, take some antidepressants and, and that should help you through this. And I just said, no, I think I just want to talk and, you know, I, I really don't want to get on, on drugs. And I didn't actually end up going back to therapy. You know, I found there were other ways that presented themselves, to, uh, people that presented themselves. You know, life kind of puts people in your life. It's that synchronicity thing again. But, you know, I, I think that um, a lot of people are going through tough times and, um, they don't know where to go for assistance. And, 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 and on top of that, the tough times are pushing humanity to uh, turn about face in their values and in, in what they're valuing and, and see the bigger picture of what, you know, life is about here on the planet, what, what we're actually doing here. And I think that that's the, one of the hugest things is that we've forgotten what we're doing here. And so in the remembering process, you know, that what they call the wake up process, I think uh, it, it's happening more and more and more that uh, people having these experiences don't know where to turn. And so they go and, and, and you know, take the, the, the drug that's recommended. And I would say if it's like a new thing and you're not currently diagnosed with anything, definitely check out an alternative way of uh working through these kinds of things with people in your life or, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah even just, in? Oh, I'm just going to say, just following that up, just the awareness and like just what you're doing, um, bringing awareness to this topic so people can just look at it and say, hey, um, this may not be a crisis. This yeah, could be it's, an it's awakening. An <laughs> yeah. 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 Young, Young was, was once quoted as saying, Dr. Carl Young, he said that you do not cure psychosis. Psychosis cures you. 
Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's so true, uh, too, though. Yeah, Whatever degree yeah. it comes in, I mean, there's definitely different, um, you know, small little bits that you wake up and then great big ones as well. And the other thing I was thinking, too, by listening to this conversation is, um, as with a birthing process, we've been comparing it to that. Um, I mean, there are women that have pain-free labor that actually have orgasmic labor. Um, it's, 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 it's more the way that the woman goes into the experience beforehand, um, what the awareness that she has going into it. So the pain isn't actually it's pressure and it's a sensation and it's an incredible euphoric experience. And so we also have this opportunity through this process of awakening to, you know, embrace it as seen as opportunity like we've been talking about or fear it. But again, with the awareness, we can choose to go through this process in a completely different way. Yeah, I think that's what it's all about. And, you know, I really think it's new. You know, we're, some people go back to shamanism and say, well, the shamans were able to go into these non-ordinary states and, and that's it. But I'll be honest, you know, shamans were not working with modern people. And I, I think it's sort of like the difference between, you know, trying to fix or trying to work with a horse and buggy and trying to work with a Ferrari. The, the, the modern mind is so sophisticated and complex and, and there's such re- emotional repression to deal with. And we can see in multiple perspectives in a, in a way that tribal people are, are generally not able to do. You know, we've got very sophisticated intellectual minds. But, you know, we got this emotional side that's just sort of locked up, you know, and, and we really need to be able to work through that stuff. Oh, that's the whole other world of uh, working within the, especially in America, working within the corporate realms. Uh, you know, there that the whole structure is set to uh, keep you chain, locked and chained at your desk for 8, 9, 10, 12, 16 hours, whatever it takes to get the job done, because we've uh, overscheduled with little manpower. <laughs> you know, that was my experience. Mm-hmm. There's no mm-hmm. room for emotional upsets. There's no room for shadow diving. There's no room for, uh, you know, uh, if, if you speak your mind, you better have the power to hold that or you're going to be shoved to the side and uh, yeah. passed into the lower you know, income bracket and you can't afford rent now and food, you know, I mean, it just, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, and you talked a lot about that in your book, Sean, where you were struggling in that world. Um, and yeah. Just you know, all these things we talk about are unproductive, right? It's unproductive for them. Oh, and yeah. I mean, you better have the flu if you're going to call in sick. <laughs> And we all know, every single one of you listening to this show, every single person in the United States at least, and I could possibly say in the planet, has called in sick because of an emotional trauma that they're going through. You have to. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it's, mm-hmm. I, I'd rather have the flu. You know, as far as, as far as having to call in sick, you know, and face the, the next day trying to pretend you have a cough or, you know, it's just not allowed. You know, yeah, yeah, some yeah. of this stuff takes a little time, so. The structures around us are not supportive, so we have to be very gentle with ourselves while we're going through these processes. And I found little ways around that when I worked in the corporate world. So take your breaks, you know. Take all your days off. (laughs) I don't know. Just to tie one thing back, Elizabeth, too, you know, you were talking about the voice. It was voices you were hearing, right? Oh. When you were 14, 15? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, you know, there, there are places, I think in Europe, it's the Hearing Voices Network, where they provide support network for people that are having, especially auditory hallucinations. And they found in their research, I think it's a minimum 80% of the voices that people hear can be linked back to some form of life trauma, usually childhood trauma. And the rates of people with who have been sexually abused, who hallucinate, it's 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 just enormous. It's like if you were sexually abused before the age of ten, you are going to be hallucinating when you're 25 years old. It's guaranteed, you know. And I, I only in the last ten years has psychiatry started to do the research to look into that because it's been such a taboo subject. But now we're finally, as a society, able to talk about things like sex abuse, like incest, that we've never talked about, you know, in the history of mankind. So I see that as a really positive positive thing and it's going on all the time i mean all over yeah. the place all the time i mean it's pretty rampant 
you know, for people to not even discuss it, you know, in a friendship, you know, it's, you know, just to dis- the overall discussions, it's, it really is, is one of those topics that is taboo to even talk about. Mm-hmm. But people are opening up, you know, they're, they're going on YouTube. There, there is a woman on YouTube who made a video about how she was molested by her father. She talked about her own incest experience. Now you talk about me having courage, wow. you know, that takes courage. Wow. 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 I, I would like to see that actually. I'm, in, I'm in a culture where there's massive amount of incest and absolute silence and it's causing a huge barrier to move the, uh, these women into a creative stream because they're having to hold on to that secret and they just uh, are frozen. They're frozen. They want to create businesses. They want to be empowered and they're completely dysfunctional. Uh, and we're going to have to bring up this topic, but they've said, you know, if we do it overtly, they're going to be killed. So, I mean, it still is going on all over the world. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you're saying that the threats, if they talk about it, that they're going to be killed, basically. The, yeah. yeah. Now, we want to do a healing center for them, and they said, just let us come and work on businesses. That our husbands will let us leave that. But if you have a healing center for domestic violence, even, the men come and they pull their women out and, and there's there's still a, a huge control grid, a huge taboo against speaking that truth and the suppression. So they're so terrified. They're afraid to allow anything authentic flow. And these are beautiful women. So I'm in the throes of that right now. It's very, very challenging. Is that in? The, do you find that in the major cities as well, or is that more of a small town or village occurrence? Well, I'm in a small town or village, and I haven't done enough research to really uh, give any statistics about that. Yeah, my my experience in Brazil is that as you move into the interior, into the sort of the jungle cities and villages, that you tend to get more incest and. And these very controlled relationships, you know, where there's where there's the lack of education, you know, the northeast of Brazil is is more known for uh, spousal abuse and, and and things like that. The cities are better, generally. Yes, there's still a great great deal of healing to be done. We have just a very we have about five more minutes, um, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Um, <sighs> what is there's a great question you put here. Uh, we're going to talk about the shift. We're going to talk about, uh, the, the, and you had some great uh, thoughts here about um, any new recent under normal people would consider crazy, but shifting people might find useful in terms of all of this topic. You know, a lot of the new age people are talking about making this shift and really sort of uh, over jumping uh, the entire shadow line of, of the human experience. What advice do you have to people? Maybe they're not having psychotic breaks tonight, but uh, and they're looking for a way to ascend and move forward and evolve. What would you say to them? Oh, like advice for moving forward? Well, you say here, yeah, as a, you know, in a real way, in an authentic way, as opposed to um, some of those th- practices that are that okay. are out there. Right. Well, you know, it, I think that once you start to get into a, a spiritual understanding, the first thing that happens is you're kind of like, wow, this is a very wow, what is possible here? What kind of world are we living in? And and I think that the reason the book, the best, the the secret was such a best a bestseller, was that you know it's got this your thoughts create reality mentality, which which just sort of makes you some kind of god that can give you whatever you want. And um, I think that there is some value in being focused, and and certainly when you have a negative attitude, it, it affects your life. You know, and my work on bipolar waking up has been very focused, and I and I believe in that. But, you know, these, these initial movements towards new age spirituality are often very ego driven. It's, and, and literally ego driven, excuse the pun, but everybody talks about that red sports car in the book, you know, the, the, the secret, you know, you've got to visualize if you want a red sports car, you need to think of a red sports car, not a, not a blue sports car, cause you might, might get the wrong car, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And, yeah, right. And, 
And so we're trying, you know, the, the, some people, some ministers in the United States have been called prosperity pimps. You know, it's it's all about, you know, visualize the bigger house and the fabulous wife and the amazing job and God will give it to you, you know. It's it's a very ego driven oriented orientation towards spirituality, and it I, I think it's probably the strongest thing happening in the New Age movement right now. And it doesn't involve any shadow work, you know. And what you're going to find, I think, is is as you move through and you sort of get past the glow of of sort of a, of a spiritual life, that you're going to go and you're going to go into some pain. Um, old issues are going to come up. You're going to be meeting people that remind you of somebody who did something terrible to you, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago. You're going to have to work through that pain. Uh, some some years might be really tough. You know, 2010 was a really hard year for me personally. Um, I had a lot of shadow work to do in that year, I, I think. But as you move forward, you know, the ego values start to fade and you really start – you know, coming from a more peaceful place, intuitively looking at just what's right for you. You know, you're 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 looking for a, a way to live in this world that makes you feel alive. Um, and so, what you see, and and Catherine Lucas again talks about it in her book, in case of spiritual emergency, is people living quite a understated life, a, a quieter, humbler life where they're putting value on things as radical as good relationships, uh, you know, fresh air, uh, simplicity. And, and because of that, I think that the, that once we really get into the spirituality, like a spiritual society, things are not going to be super spectacular and wow, power is happening here and there, but things are going to get a lot quieter, a lot simpler, you know. That's beautifully said. Thank you so much. Any further Thanks, thoughts? Man. Yeah, no, that is really, really beautiful. We have two minutes left, I'm told. Uh, Sean, could we trouble you to give out your information again. Where do people go to learn more, to get help with this, to have understanding whether they're in the crisis or whether they want it for their friends or just for their own understanding of awakening? Okay, well, everything uh, that I have available is from my website at bipolar or waking up.com. That's all one word, bipolar or waking up.com. Uh, through Google, if you're lo- just looking for videos or on YouTube, if you uh, put in the words bipolar spiritual, you'll get a whole bunch of videos from me. So I'm not hard to find. And my contact information is on my website as well. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, maybe we could just mention just for a second who's coming on next week. Um, Christina, Elizabeth, it's Sonia, correct? December 2nd, yes. Yes, Sonia Barrett, correct? Correct, absolutely. We're really, really excited to have Sonia on. She's an amazing woman, authentic, knowledgeable. She is a powerhouse. She's really fun. Um just really excited to have her on. Sean, we are so grateful for you taking time to be with us tonight. Uh, I just really, really want to give you kudos for coming out of the closet with your authentic being and then having such passion. I could just feel the life force gushing out of you and your mission, your commitment, your care for humanity and your authenticity bless you and thank you for sharing your journey with us tonight. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It's been great to talk to you guys too. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Elizabeth. Christina, Sienna, thank you all very much. It's been great to be here. To embrace the darkness in which I swim. Now walking back down this mountain, the strength of a turn and the tide, oh the wind so soft at my skin, yeah the sun so hot upon my side, all oh, looking out at this happiness, I search for between the sheets, or oh, feeling blind, to realize all I was searching for was me, oh oh.
same 